Well, good afternoon. I am Colonel Albert Mernier, an advisor at this National Defense Institute. And I have the pleasure and the honor of being the chair of this webinar entitled 2030 Africa on the World Chessboard. First of all, let me express my pleasure for having such a large audience at the time when I think fortunately Africa is not on the spotlight. Before handing over the floor to the director of the National Defense Institute, Professor Isabel Ferreira Nunes, I would like uh, to make some considerations about the discipline to be adopted during this webinar in order to ensure that it runs smoothly and efficiently. First of all, I would ask our guest speakers to, as far as possible, respect the 20 minute time limit for each intervention. The first topic, Africa on the World Chessboard, structures, challenges, and opportunities will be, be shared by two speakers. So the total time should, should not exceed uh, 40 minutes, but I believe it's going to be shorter. Each presentation will be followed by a question and answer period of approximately 10 minutes. I ask our audience to use, to use the tool provided by Zoom to ask the floor by raising their hands electronically. For the event to run smoothly, it is also essential to ensure a good microphones discipline. So I ask that you make sure that your microphones are turned off unless you are given the floor. I wish a fruitful working journey to all. So I hand the floor to uh, National Defense Institute Director, Professor Isabel Ferreira Nunes. Nós estamos a ouvir, Sr. Professor. My apologies. Boa Thank tarde. Thank you, Sr. Marinheiro. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, dear guests. I would like to address you a warm welcome. Also, take this opportunity to thank our four guest speakers that will lend their expertise to today's webinar, which, as you know, it's a joint organization from the National Defense Institute and the Faculty of Social and Human Sciences of Universidade Nova. And uh, the African continent plays an important role in global security for a number of reasons. And, and to be brief, I would only highlight three. First, uh, the continent's strategic location. The fact this continent owns important natural resources, but also the myriad of security challenges that the continent faces nowadays. And, and thinking about Africa on the world chessboard, uh, I would like to call your attention for five key elements which matter when we analyze it. And the first element regards the strategic location of Africa along maritime corridors, which means that any instability in these strategic points of passage from the Horn of Africa to the Gulf of Guinea may dramatically affect international trade. A second aspect uh, regards the presence of power voids and sometimes weak governance. And the combination of these two elements creates indeed opportunities for destabilizing interferences, both from internal and external actors, notably through terrorist activities and organized crime, especially, as you all know, in the region, uh, in the Sahel region, but also in East and West Africa. The third aspect I would like to, to call your attention um, is the combined effects of instability and war with those which are very impactful of climate change. And this combination uh, frequently leads to populations forced movements in the continent, within countries or between countries, also to migration flows and displaced people. A fourth element regards Africa's position in global security uh, supply chain. Africa is an important, has an important role uh, in digital and energy transition. And of course, by having an importance at this level, this creates and attracts global power competition and self-interested engagements in Africa, whether those take the form of investments in infrastructure 
or, or on the establishment of military bases or through partnerships with African countries that unfortunately do not necessarily benefit local economies or societies. And the fifth and last, um, it's a more, let's say, hopeful aspect and uh, regards Africa's uh, African nations uh, position as uh, international peacekeepers with the support of the United Nations or African Union, which shows the importance of the continent as a whole in setting conditions for a better peace, uh, a more resilient security, and also for better development. I'm quite sure these and other uh, important aspects will be uh, addressed in depth for our by our guest speakers and also by our audience. And with this, I would end wishing you a very fruitful webinar. Thank you. Thank you Professor. I will now, uh, let's begin with the first topic, Africa on the world chessboard, chessboard structures, challenges, and opportunities. This, this uh, topic is going to be presented by two uh, uh, conferences. First, uh, Professor uh, uh, Teresa Rodrigues. She is a full professor in the Department of Political Studies at the Faculty of, Science, of Social Science and Humanities of Nova University in Lisbon and a visiting professor at Nova Information Management School. So I'm, I'm going to try to share the presentation. Okay. Professor Teresa Rodrigo, can you see the present? We are not listening. Please, please uh, turn. Turn on your, your okay. microphone. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good afternoon. So, um, first of all, in my name and of uh, Professor uh, Felix Ribeiro, I want to congratulate uh, the director of the Portuguese Institute of National Defense, Professor uh, Isabel Ferreira Nunes, for this initiative and her invitation. Uh, my greetings also to the other members of this panel and, of course, to uh, the audience. So the presentation you are about to see is a synthesis of a research made under the scope, the challenge, I would say, of the Institute um, about Africa. It concerns Africa and its structures, challenges and opportunities in the coming years. Next slide, please. So, so uh, following a roadmap divided in, in five points that you can see, uh, we propose to all of you uh, a journey about the structural uh, uh, aspects that allow us to draw a portrait of the African continent, a continent composed by 54 political states and a significant diversity in ethnic, linguistic, religious and also socio-economic and political stability terms. Based on the analysis of several indicators, we will try to identify in the next minutes the multiple realities internally coexisting in the African continent um, today. We also propose uh, a seven macro-regional division of Africa and we'll discuss in the third place the external relationships that in the coming years we consider that might have a significant role in the positioning of the African continent in the international system. We start by referring to Africa's potential uh, opportunities and disadvantages from the characteristics that seem to define the profile of the continent um, in structural terms. Um, seven main challenges arise associated with two major sets of opportunities which coexist with risks of different types. The intersection of all of them has geographically different impacts. Those challenges coexist with opportunities. But these last ones 
can only be turned into windows of opportunity if the negative effects of the risks associated with the security and stability of African countries can be reduced and assumed human security to all its citizens. We foresee five main types of competitive advantages. The first relies on potential, uh, on human potential, which can uh, represent a huge opportunity in terms of active and active balance and pave the way for a better future. The demographic youth is a consequence of high fertility rate, but also of the expected increase in average life expectancy. We believe that the benefits brought by global technology and science improvement put at the service of the populations can, will make it possible to solve in the next decades part of the pressure on resources and partially re reduce the internal asymmetries in the distribution of well-being. That reduction will have a positive impact in terms of access to healthcare, vital resources and essential infrastructure. Simultaneously, the projected reduction of fertility levels creates conditions for the younger generations to have better levels of education and training, which could allow access to more qualified employment, increase family income and consumption, improve living conditions. But there are also weaknesses. In 2016, the World Economic Forum drew the big picture of global risks in the coming years and their impact on region by regions. It said then, and uh, we can prolong those st these statements to this day, that the greatest risks facing Africa as a whole were geographic, uh, geopolitical and economic in nature. Lack of political stability is the main one, reduced labor market, market flexibility and the failure of critical infrastructure were the other ones. In fact, the continent shows negative, um, negative indicators in terms of governance, political real, re reliability and high levels of corruption. The labor market lack of flexibility, the struggle for the possession of resources, the asymmetrical distri distribution of health and social and ethnic tensions are both a cause and a consequence that puts in risk the human security of African populations. Environmental changes act as multipliers of risks. Pollution has been increasing as well as soil degradation, scarcity of drinking water and hunger as a result of a symmetric distribution of resources accentuated in the context of rapid population growth. Another handicap is visible um, when we look at the low indicators of human development index with some countries, with some African countries, facing decreasing trends while internal social inequality and economic uh, inequality increase. In economic terms, most regions face high unemployment rates, mainly among young people and in cities, parallel economy and high cost of living compared to average income. Africa also continues to have a limited global projection. Regional integration processes and agreements are complex and it seems difficult um, to assume strategic, a strategic action due to different national interests, interests and their choices um, in the field of foreign policy and economic alliances. According to the index of the Spanish Institute Elcano, six countries represent two thirds of the African presence in the world, South Africa, Egypt, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Uganda and Kenya, all of them with valuable resources, uh, natural resources and a strong participation in peacekeeping missions. 
As already said, we consider, considered in our analysis seven macro-regional realities with relevant differences between them. Um, this slide shows their geographic localization and composition. Um, those uh, seven regions are the, the ones you can see there, North Africa and Mediterranean area, Sahelian Africa and Sudanese uh, area, West Africa, Central Africa, a group formed by Central Africa, Atlantic Africa and Great Lakes region, Austral Africa, East Africa and the Horn of Africa. Why and how did we get to, to distinguish these uh, four macro regions? Um, then uh, I don't know if I can already uh, uh, call uh, Professor Felix Ribeiro so that he could manage his part of the, the um, this presentation. I'm sorry, Professor, N not yet. yet. We are expecting him to arrive at, at any moment. Okay. Let's see if one. So, so I, I, I ask let's you to continue. To of course, of course. Okay. let's continue. Thank you. Um, so um, when you look uh, at the, the main composition and the way the methodological uh, aspect that that um, that made us distinguish those seven regions, um, please put the other slide if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. So each macro region was defined based on three fundamental criteria. The tribes still dominant uh, in each region today and their historical relationship with Islam. The second, uh, the second component was the connection that political history prior to, to European colonization allowed it to create in Africa like kingdoms and the empires and their relationship with tribes, and still the importance of the natural and territorial resources of each macro region and the nature of trade flows around these resources. One of the focuses of our exercise also included identifying the external support, both military, political, economic, and financial, that currently characterizes the countries that compose each of these macro regions. Let's take a closer look, look at each of these aspects. Uh, thank you, Professor. Now we are in conditions to present Professor uh, okay. Felix Rivail. He's just arrived. I think he's going to continue the presentation. Okay. So Professor Felix Rivail is PhD in International Relations from the Faculty of Social and Human Sciences of the University Nova of Lisboa, and from 2012 to the present, is consultant to the Board of Directors of the Carlos de Gulbenkian Foundation. Uh, Professor Felix Rivey, you have the floor. Very good afternoon. Meu coronel, o professor tem que ligar o microfone. Meu coronel, tem que desbloquear o, o microfone do professor no, 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 na, no computador. No Zoom, no Zoom. Sim, no, no Zoom, top. exatamente. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, the, the, when we, we try to, to analyze the, the diversity of Africa in terms of macro regions, uh, we have chosen to uh, understand basically two processes. A, 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 a historical process uh, which is linked with tribes and kingdoms and empires that, that have been built in Africa in the Middle Ages and after in the Modern Age. When we choose to uh, speak about tribes, it's a very uh, surprising thing 
but the states that have uh, been constituted uh, during decolonization are uh, very uh, have a very uh, short story. Uh, tribes have a very important uh, stock of historical past of Africa. So, uh, trying to understand the difference between uh, regions in Africa, uh, if we uh, if we rely the, the the right the right images, the right maps. Uh, beginning in, in, in the left, in left, modern, modern left, we have a map with the partition of Africa during European colonialism, and so we can uh, we can understand, we can see the, that France was concentrated in what we we are going to say as uh, North Africa, and in what uh, we are going to define as Sahel region, and of also West Africa. This is France. The United Kingdom was completely different. What, what in, uh, the United Kingdom was in Egypt and Sudan, and after in West Africa, in Nigeria, Nigeria, and after in the south, uh, in the, what was uh, will be going to be named uh, Rhodesia and Nyasalandia, and after South Africa. South Africa. This is this is before the beginning of, of the First World War. Germany. German had uh, Togo, which is here, Camarões, Camarón, um, Namibia, and Tanzania. Portugal had Guinea and Cap Cap Verde, Angola, and Mozambique. This, because this is the partition of Africa between European countries. But when we, if we try to understand the story, the history of Africa, we must uh, and we must understand the importance of tribes. Uh, I, I I will left here uh, with the IDN uh, a small text that we have. Professor Teresa and me done about tribes and about kingdoms and empires, so that we you, you could uh, understand better because this is this is a, a chart with the most important tribes in Africa, but you are not going to see very well as I don't see very well. Uh, what we, we try to to, to 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 say, there are big tribes in in Africa, and these big tribes, which are the ones we have in in, in yellow, uh, have been linked with uh, the creation of kingdoms and empires. These tribes, these big, or some of the these big tribes. But also, some of them have a, 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 a known own religion, and the, most of them have their own language. The, the biggest uh, tribe in Africa is the Alsa. Alsa is, you can see here, it is Alsa. Alsa have, uh, you can see, uh, Seven, um, seventy-four, 74 uh, million people, and and it is dispersed in several countries, but mainly in Niger Nigeria. 
the second one, the second one um, biggest is the Yoruba. Yoruba have, has uh, 40, uh, 47 million people. Uh, and they have their own religion and their own language. Uh, we have also tried to understand the um, the region, the riqueza, the, 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 how they are, how each tribe are rich. Also, is not only the biggest, but also the, with more uh, wealth. Uh, Yoruba, it's the third in what concerns uh, wealth. Uh, but uh, is the second in what concerns the number of members. Yoruba is very important because it is also in Nigeria, but they have, they have created an empire. Uh, we are going to see this because also also were, also they were they were they are today the biggest and the richest but they didn't create a, a, an empire. They, they had a collection of uh, city-states uh, in six uh, cities. And they, are, uh, they, they, are, they were uh, positioned in uh, trade, uh, in the center of several trade networks in Africa. The, the the third one I, I I will speak I'm not going to speak about all, all of them because this uh, chart is going to you can obtain it uh, in the, the the text that I'm going to leave here in India. Uh, Igbo uh, Igbo have uh, four uh, four five million people. I, I, it is interesting to speak, to explain the political importance in uh, our times of Alsa and Igbo. Uh, you, you, I don't know if you remember that Nigeria, in a certain moment, was divided by a secession, uh, the, 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 the secession of part of Nigeria that wanted to become independent. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it was the, 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 the and this this the secession of inside Nigeria resulted from a, 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 a rivalry between Alsa and Igbo tribes for control of Nigeria. And the Igbo, the, 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 the Igbo considered that they were more prepared to govern Nigeria than the Alsa. So one of civil wars that have uh, happened in Africa immediately after the decolonization was a fight between two tribes. Although n nobody speaks this from this point of view, uh, point of view. Uh, after uh, if we, if we leave the tribes, we we go to kingdoms and empires in the map uh, you have in the right uh, of the chart. There is a consent. Uh, no, this map, sorry, this map is a geographical position of those tribes. So you understand that there in, in, in this zone of Africa, there is a concentration of big tribes. All those tribes are some of those that are here. But we also see that there are concentrations of tribes for example, here in the Great Lakes or here in the Horn of Africa and also uh, in the South of Africa, Afri uh, South Africa. South Africa, it is interesting because three of the tribes of South Africa are 
not included in the biggest, but they are included in the richest tribes of Africa. If we try to, 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 to speak about uh, kingdoms and empires, we have here a, a map to explain this. There, there, is, there have been two uh, uh, empire to kingdoms, impo important kingdoms uh, in North Africa in Middle Ages when they are Arabs and when they were linked with, with Andalusia. Uh, so, North Africa, so th those two empires. After Sahel and West Africa have the big concentration of empires. One empire is the Mali Empire. The other one is the Songhai Empire here. And also a king, the Kingdom of Ghana. Some, one thing that linked all the three but, but basically, Ghana and Mali is gold. Gold. We, we cannot forget that F, the gold of Africa was fundamental for the money, the, the monetary uh, development of Europe, because this gold that came from Mali and from Burkina, what are today Burkina Faso and from Ghana, they arrived in, in Europe crossing the desert of Sahara. One of the uh, objectives of the early movement of discoveries from Portugal was to arrive here in a place we, that we have called Mina, because Mina was the, the place in, in which we become, we Portugal, become to our important to bring gold to Europe. Although the gold that we have explored in this relation was fundamental for the financing of the India, uh, the India discovery. So this is uh, this is a very important uh, concentration of uh, empires and kingdoms. Here are the kingdoms that are linked with the Congo. The, 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 the Congo River in the middle of uh, Africa. Here is Zimbabwe, and here are, is Ethiopia, and before Ethiopia, another kingdom. So this is very important because Africa has a very rich political, economical, and cultural existence in thus kingdoms and empires that have disappeared after the European uh, the European uh, colonization. Uh, uh, as a second criterion that we have choose to try to understand to delimitate the macro regions in Africa is the natural resources and mainly the mineral and uh, energetic resources from Africa. You have here a map. This is not a very good, uh, uh, we have chosen from Al Jazeera, for, uh, and we have chosen because the colors, they are very, very clear. Although this map of Al Jazeera is not completely correct, but the colors are good to understand. Uh, this, th th this, um, color is oil. 
we have a, an idea that oil is important as uh, uh, resources from several countries in uh, in Africa. But the most important thing here is gold. Uh, which we have here. What, what, what happened? So we have arrived. Uh, we have arrived. You, you, you are going to have all of this explained. We have constructed. Uh, uh, we, we can go before this. Sorry. Because uh, Professor Teresa Rodrigues uh, uh, has uh, given the uh, seven macro regions that we have shoes. The first macro region is North Africa. Second one is the Sahel region. The third one is West Africa. The fourth is something that came from Atlantic to uh, to, the, left, to the, the right, which is Central Africa. After we have uh, South Africa, Eastern Africa, and the Horn of Africa. You, you have here, uh, uh, sorry. We have uh, in this uh, presentation, a, a, small, a small characterization of each of the, the, the regions from the point of view of tribes, of kingdoms, of resources, and uh, about also some uh, more recent characteristics. I'm not going to, 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 to explain this or to give because this is here in, in our, in our uh, presentation. Now, uh, we, no, no, we are going to, to, to analyze, Professor uh, Teresa Rodriguez are going to analyze how different are these seven regions from the point of view of demography. demography. So, uh, Professor Teresa Rodriguez, you have. Thank you. Um, yes, um, as already said, um, the demographic dynamics of the African population are distinct from all others in the world and represent opportunities, but also um, possible risks uh, of uh, regionally differentiated or endogenous character. So this table highlights the contrasts between the um, some some of these groups that uh, Professor Felix Ribeiro already talked about, the group uh, two, three, and four, Sahel, West, Central, and Atlantic Africa, versus the North of Africa, South, and uh, East Africa. So uh, groups one, five, and six. First of all, in terms of uh, the percentage weight of each of them, more than 26% of Africans live in West Africa. Southern and uh, Sahelian Africa are the smallest, with 6 and 8% of the continent's population. Um, differences also exist uh, in terms of the average age of resident population, which range from a maximum of 29 years in average in the north of Africa uh, to 16 years in Sahelian Africa and Sudan. Fertility levels explain those asymmetries, varying from a percentage, uh, an average of 2.4 children per woman in North Africa, and more than 5.4 in the Sahel regions and Sudan. There is also a positive direct relationship between regions with more moderate growth rates of the population, higher average ages, and higher percentage of urban population. The entire African continent suffers also intense migratory flows, which include a growing percentage of forced migrants, whether internally displaced or refugees, 
the latter usually looking for neighboring countries. Economic dynamism explains the positive results of Austral Africa. Um, it's the only part of Africa who has a positive uh, migratory rate, and that's all of it explained by the, um, the indicators of South Africa, which has long attracted people from neighboring countries and also from other continents. The African continent uh, is expected to register an unprecedented population growth in the coming decades. By 2050, even considering a moderate growth scenario, one in each four people will be African. The macro regions uh, two and four, that is Sahel, Sudan, and Central and Atlantic Africa and Great Lakes, will have almost twice as the, the, the residents they have at this moment, the moment as we, sp as we speak. And sub-regions three, six, and seven will register uh, increases of si 65 to 70, and some regions, North and Austral Africa, just over an increase of just 30%. You know what? When we see the, the, the big countries uh, in demographic terms, of course, the demographic giants, as we can say, Nigeria is um, an undisputed demographic leader. It stands, uh, it represents 57% of West Africa, and we till, it will maintain their weight with an expected growth of 65% uh, until the middle uh, of this century. Ethiopia is the second African giant. It corresponds to 64% of the total population of the Horn of Africa. Um, in the same group is also Sudan. Um, which will increase more than 70% until mid-century. Egypt, um, ranking in the third place, is the disputed leader of North Africa with more than 112 million inhabitants in 2024 and it is an expected increase of 40% uh, by um, mid-century. It now accounts for more than half of the population of Group 1, of the group of North African um, countries, a leadership that might increase in the coming years. The set uh, that includes Central and Atlantic Africa and the Great Lakes region has two main countries, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda. The first one, corresponds to 42% of the Central uh, Atlantic group and will rise um, about 46% until mid-century. More modest, Uganda accommodates today 20% of the population of this group and will slightly lose relative weight. Two other large uh, countries are located in the East African subregion. We refer to Tanzania in the fifth position and Kenya in the seventh position. Tanzania is expected to almost double, but Kenya's increase will be more modest. The sixth position belongs to South Africa, the indisputed leader of Austral Africa, where it represents two thirds of the total inhabitants. It is estimated, however, a population increase of less than 21% until 2050, which explains the drop of the representativeness of the country from the actual 67% to 60%. And now, again, um, I will take the floor for, to Felix Rivain. Uh, Felix is without sound. Please turn on the sound. So, sorry. Uh, now uh, we are going to, to change from demography to geoeconomics. And we are going to use a very curious and interesting uh, report, annual report, 
done by DRL. DRL, as you know, are a, logistic, a global logistic company that uh, every year publish this DRL Global Connectedness Index, in which uh, they classify uh, 130 countries. Uh, under than 30 countries, and they try to characterize for each country the, the, what we are going to see in the right, which is an, an uh, uh, which is an infography to explain the real the external relations of the democratic, for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and w w what we can understand from this image, what are the five more, the ten more important countries in which, with which, the the the, the Democratic Republic of Congo have geoeconomic relations, trade, investment, uh, people that uh, that migrate from one place to other, uh, information, uh, the obtain of information, and so on. So what are the most important partners, external partners of the Democratic Republic of Congo? First, United States with 45% of the external re of this index, the connectedness that uh, the AGL uh, has built. The second most important country is China. The third is South Africa. The fourth, Rwanda. And the, five, uh, the fifth, Uganda and the six Singapore. It's important to understand that there is none, no, no European country today which has a partner, an economic partnership with the Democratic Republic of Congo similar to United States, China, as, all over the world, and and also the concentration in with South Africa, Rwanda, and Uganda. If we, we if we try to understand this, uh, comparing, uh, analyzing the, the all of the the, the country the countries of Africa, we can say that United States, China, India, and Russia. We are going to see that which is completely different. It, it, it has relations, but not very economic relations. And this is the countries, countries of Af Africa that have more relations with this four, the three countries, N Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, Rep Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, Tanzania, and Kenya. We, we have called those countries gates for the world. But each of this area, those countries, have relations with macro regional spaces, inside of which there are several countries. After we try to understand, to, to define, and as, uh, this, 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 uh, this image of macro regions in Africa that have inside relations and external relations with this. This is one of the reasons why we speak about Africa as a continent of the world. 
because before it was a continent for uh, of Europe. Uh, we, we, we explained this and so on, and we tried to explore the relations between Africa and the United States and China and Russia. But I, 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 I have. Sorry. I have, we have to conclude. Yes, 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 yes. The, because uh, there are two rivalries in, in Africa. In geoeconomic terms, there's the rivalry between, between the United States and China. And in security and defense is the rivalry between the United States and Russia. This, uh, this is... Uh, now we are going to. Uh, you have maps and so on here, and now we, 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 Professor Teresa Rodriguez is going to give the the, the image, the, the, the last image of our <laughs> presentation. Oh, uh, please, yeah. please be as brief, brief, brief oh, yes, as yes, possible. Yes. No, so so uh, the 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 question was the question that remains for our discussion is also is is in fact uh, if we must look or use if we must look at Africa as a continent of the world, but also as a, an Africa of macro regions. So that is, uh, in fact, we have to consider those both. Uh, to to we believe that we must consider both. Uh, both, uh, both statements, both statements are true. So what we um, we managed or we tried to do in this with our research and all the information of that research um, uh, we have presented here uh, can be consulted in more detail in the article that um, we wrote for the next uh, issue of the journal uh, Nação e Defesa of the Portuguese Institute of, of National Defense. So I won't take uh, much longer and I will um, reserve some, some possibility of time and minutes for answering any question or doubt that our audience might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are a little, a little bit uh, late. So I'm going to open the floor, but I have already heard one question on the chat and I read it right away. It's a question for our uh, auditor, Paul Rocha Trindade, which is, uh, how do you, re you relate the macro regions with the RECs, regional economic communities? Bearing in mind that there are some overlappings. So I, I think this question fits all, both to Professor Teresa Rodrigues as well for Professor uh, Félix Ribeiro. So uh, I just uh, leave to your... Uh... I will try to answer it. I think those macro regions are not completely... Uh, over uh, overposed they are completely different uh, and uh, what we try in, in, in this uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, an article that we have uh, are going to publish in the 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the national it feels uh, in uh, of uh, EDN. Uh, is that each of those macro regions have preferred relations with some exterior, external powers. And in, in, this, uh, in this way, we can say that Africa, that the macro regions of Africa compose for all of Africa, a very diversified contest of foreign relations, because each of them are different from the other. Uh, this is what I can say. Uh, <clears throat> for example, let me say for 
Russia, surprisingly, is very interested in Sahel, in which then Russia didn't have nothing of a relation. And one of the things that interests more Russia in Sahel is gold. To have access to gold, to mines of gold. Because uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that uh, Russia in, in geoeconomic terms is more um, how to say concentrated it, it to, is to the dollar is the, do, the dollarization Russia wants uh, a new life for gold in the international monetary system because she is a great producer of gold and in Africa, it is, in, uh, she, uh, it is very interested in places where there, are, there is gold. Thank you, Professor. I, I, wonder, I wonder if Professor Teresa Rodrigues wants to make any comment. No, no, not, uh, thank you. Not, not much. Uh, uh, I believe that some of the, the of this question, and I think, um, our audience for for the, our auditor for this for this uh, remark. I believe that what we must take into account is that uh, when we try to 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 constitute to to identify those micro regions, we have a lot of uh, a different um, levels of understanding and of differentiated uh, each of those regions that takes into account uh, demographic uh, questions, the resources, the the historical. Uh, evolution and ethical and kingdoms and all this. So, um, and of course, when we, it's true that, that we can find in Africa a, a very complex reality and very complex realities and, and identities that are formed and overlapped each with one, one with the others. But uh, of course, when we try to to create models, you always lose some some um, detailed, more detailed variables. So you have to forget them if, if you want to try to make a, a global overview of of some reality. So that's just that. Thank you very much. Since I don't see any raised hands, and we are a little bit late, I think we can go on to to, to the second. Um, uh presentation but uh first of all let me say here in the chat there are somebody asking if uh, we can have the link of the article to be published in the so it feels of course the link will be available on the etn's website so wants to to have the access to this publication can just check on the our website and it will be there so uh i think it's uh, the, the answer for the, some questions i hear in the chat so the second uh, subject of our uh, program is uh, Africa in global communication networks, a changing paradigm with Cornel Luis Bernardin, which is a Portuguese army colonel in a reserve with more than 37 years of experience in the United Nations, NATO and EU missions. He is currently professor at the Department of International Relations at the Universidade Autónoma de Lisboa. Uh, Coronel Bernardino, please, you have the floor, sir. Well, um, good afternoon. Uh, your sound is a little bit lower, but I understood. Thank you very much, for Coronel, for uh, these very kind words. Um, I ask you if you allowed me to have my PowerPoint from here. Um, and, of course, I would like to salute the audience. Um, I think it's always important to discuss Africa, and we're going to take this chance to see another view about Africa. And I have to thank you, Sora Teresa Rodrigues, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure joining. And I also salute Sora Felix Ribeiro, my colleague here in the university, and also a big and a special salute for the director of the National Defense Institute, Professor Isabel Ferreira Nunes. And it's always a pleasure. And Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will have a slide. I, want, I would like to 
to provide. Um, um, let me. Okay. So um, I will have this these slides for the presentation, and I hope you can you can see it now. Yeah, no, that's okay. So uh, when when I was invited to talk about Africa in in the future, uh, twenty thirty, what is the player and why? What is what is changing in Africa? My my question and my arguments is that we are now in a changing moment in Africa. We are now in a in a position where Africa can play a bigger role in the global communication networks. And also because if you can see the relation between knowledge and between connectivity and development, you see that this phrase makes and, and I'm, I'm quite sure that everybody will agree that those states, those continents that has more easy access to the global connectivity, of course, they are in better position to get and to achieve development. And that's that's why I, I want to try. I want to show you that Africa was behind at the very beginning of the connectivity, the global connectivity. And now, because of the new dy dynamic of the sea cables majority, the Africa will play a different role. My question in the end is this new role can be another level of development for Africa? Let's see and let's think a little bit about this. So when we talk about connectivity, we talk about being part of a global dynamic where economical dimension, defense dimension, financial dimension, everything is related to connectivity. Your mobile phones, your television, your computers, 97% of the communication now flows on the sea cables. Uh, I don't want to explain what is a sea cable, but let me know for those who are a little bit aside of that, that when we talk about sea cables, it's a system. Sea cables is the part wet of the system, but we always have to think as a system that has power stations and also landing stations where the cable connect when they land and also the data center, which is, in my view, the most important of the system because the information, the knowledge, the, the data is still there and that makes the difference because the connectivity inside the sea cables, it's something that is normally and doesn't bring add value. What is important is the control of the data centers and the control of the data. And the, uh, allowed me to show a, a very nice and very interesting slide and see uh, how Africa was behind in the very beginning when we talk about connectivity, global connectivity. So in the 1960s, we, we first, for the first time, we have submarine cables installing. Well, it was not like today, submarine cables, but it was like a connectivity. And only in the 1980s, we start to have a personal computers coming to the cities and the connectivity, the first connectivity in the continent was South Africa in the 1994. So you see, Africa was completely behind this global approach and it was not able to see what it was developing around the world. And if you can see on the 2010, uh, we can see, of course, a growing of, of mobile phones and smartphones and mobile banking. And today we are facing a new dimension in Africa because we are facing a new significant artificial intelligence and access to information. As we're gonna see very shortly, and I have to say that this PowerPoint presentation is gonna be available for those required to the organization. So I will throw, I will go to some of these slides uh, and I want, uh, I don't want to take more than 20 minutes, but I would like to show you the difference between the past and between what's happened now concerning the global connectivity of the continent and see if this can bring a different vision on the development of the continent. As we, as we, as we know, um, and of course, uh, Professor Felix Gibeiro and Teresa Rodrigues, they mentioned that 
if you see this color, this map, uh, the GDP in Africa is very low. It's very low from the rest of the world. Of course, we know that Africa is an undeveloped continent. Um, in my view, is because it's completely outside of this connectivity. Was not able to connect. Was not able to have access to to the information, to the knowledge. And this is one of the reasons. Of course, it's not the only one, but maybe one of the major reason, uh, reasons why the continent, why Africa is underdeveloped related with the rest of the world. And of course, if you see uh, by, by the other side of the coin, the lack of the basic skills, they are in Africa. So they don't have access to knowledge. They don't have access to information. They don't have access to development. And that's why um, I will hope that we are now in a changing moment and I will show you what's happened and why I'm talking about this new moment. This is my introduction to you and I'm gonna split in these three moments. Let's talk about the past, the present and the future and with some conclusions uh, concerning challenges and opportunity for Africa on the 2030 and maybe uh, after this, 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 uh, these times. If you see, if you go back 1891, and if you see the global connectivity of sea cables, Africa was uh, completely, I will not say completely, but it was really, uh, the interior of Africa was completely outside of the connectivity. And uh, during the, the, the telegraph time, uh, it was completely out of the main roads of the communication. And the main roads of the communication was of course, in the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, of course, in the Asia Pacific, South Atlantic, and uh, Africa was, of course, not one of the most important connections. And if you see on the 1910, then it's even more visible that the connectivity, of course, was North Atlantic, was North Hemisphere, was Asia, was Pacific. Uh, around Africa, you see most of the countries on the coastline didn't have access to internet, uh, or, or sorry, to the telegraph communications uh, in the 1910s. It was an empty space. It was no connections. In the interior of the continent was completely lost of the link for, from the outside of the global world. Uh, of course, the, the North Atlantic was the center of gravity. And if you move forward, in the 2007, you still see a very few and a very small connections. Uh, some of the countries on the coastline, on the east coastline, never had until 2010 a sea cables connections or even a telegraph connections. So, uh, uh, of course, we not can, cannot generalize in Africa because Africa, it's many countries, many different regions, different realities, but the majority of the continent didn't have, have access to the telegraph, neither to the internet until the 2020s or the 2014-15. Um, and if you see now, we can face a changing. So we are, we are of course, uh, in, in, in a completely dynamic uh, process in certain, concerning the sea cables, the North Atlantic, Still, one very important and very significant area for the sea cables. And what we see now is that Africa becomes more and more relevant, more and more cables and more and more connectivity. Um, and of course, this is my uh, understanding that this, is, this is, could be uh, one of the reasons why the development in Africa can be in another uh, paradigm in another way, in another position. Uh, and what we see now is that the two Africa, which is the biggest cable around the world, they connect all, or I would say the majority of the countries in Africa, and they connect also Europe and Asia, and there's always um, a very strong connectivity. So what we see now is that Africa, Africa becomes uh, one opportunity for business, and this to Africa, it's the biggest sea cable in the world, 45 kilometers, 
It connects 33 kilo, uh, countries, including United Kingdom, Kingdom, India, and some of the countries in the Middle East. So this is the reality. And the reality says that Africa now is becoming one of the most important regions where the, uh, uh, the number of sea cables are increasing. And they are increasing, of course, uh, they are bringing more development to uh, Africa. And just, just, just an interesting point, two interesting points. First, we have more mobile phones in Africa than persons. So each person in, the, in Africa, they could have two or three mobile phones, which is interesting because in the rate and the number of mobile phones, they are at the level of Europe or even bigger. Uh, so the people start to have uh, uh, connections, of course, they don't have the same uh, the, the connection at the easy the easy way and is very expensive expensive, but at the same time we're going to see a changing moment. And the second is that, uh, for example, we spoke about FDC and about Kinshasa. Uh, I just like to 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 tell you that uh, three millions of habitants in Kinshasa, which is about forty five percent, they rely on the internet. And you know that the internet from Kinshasa is in a data center. And you know what is the data center in Lisbon? So Lisbon is the data center that provides internet from one of the biggest city in Africa. And you have more. It's just uh, uh, one, one, one curiosity and one point that shows how the connectivity and how we are dependent each other for having uh, access to the internet and of course, access to knowledge. Uh, so this is the pictures. Of course, Portugal is, is all, all is connected with uh, the, this cable, the two Africa, which is the biggest cable. This is a picture in Carcavelos uh, for the, the, to the landing station. And so what is the add value? I don't want to go on details because uh, Professor Teresa Rodrigues, they mentioned uh, about uh, several of these things. But economic growth is, of course, one of the things. You are part of the global economy. You are part of the global dynamics that brings money to the business. And if you are outside of the, of the connectivity, you never be able to link to the other economies. So you lose. Uh, of course, it brings power reduction. It brings also health improvement. Uh, it's, 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 of course, gender equality, social cohesion, sustainable development, which, which means that if the societies, they have uh, access to knowledge, they have access to the communication, they are in a better position to achieve what other level of development, other level of sustainable development. Um, I, would, I would allow to take the opportunity to show a couple of slides with some numbers. Always numbers mean something, but we have to be a uh, caution and we have to look numbers with a, a certain uh, different of angles because sometimes they can be tricky. Uh, but if you see, uh, if you look for Africa, the global internet estimates graph uh, Africa will be on the next years, the country that, go, that grow, grow more. So we expect that will grow 43% in the connections. Globally, we will see an increase of, of 33%. It means that Africa, the decalage of Africa, it's that Africa is gonna, gonna, gonna grow very fast on the access to the internet. Um, and of course, globally, uh, with the 5G, with the internet of things, with the internet AI, the need, to access the internet will grow. And what we see is that globally, the access to internet will grow uh, in a very uh, significant numbers. But in Africa, these numbers are gonna be much bigger. I have the links on the slides. You can follow the links and you have much more information if you need to know a little bit more. Uh, so you see that uh, we are growing we are growing a lot on the access to the internet. Uh, during the last 10 years, we almost uh, have three times the number of the access uh, globally. And Africa, 
uh, is is not in this line is above this line so it means that africa will grow more than the average of the global connectivity to the internet uh, some 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 numbers uh, of course that today the number of using internet uh, uh, in africa is not very high uh, the, the the access to the internet still uh, in in the lower level but you see the percentage will grow very fast. Young people, they have access to the internet and they will see a, a changing in the using of the internet during the next years. Uh, this, is a, this is a couple of slides. I don't want to go with these slides in details. We are running out of time. So please use it Then you can have the links. And if you have any questions, just let me know by email. I will be more than happy to, 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 to come with you and to have some discussions about these numbers. Um, so another, another thing that might be interesting is that uh, Africa depends on, on Europe for the internet. I'll just give you an example about uh, Kinshasa and about Lisbon, but we have much more. So um, globally, uh, Africa in average depends about 75%. It means that 75% of the internet that is in Africa depends from countries in Europe. Uh, UK, France, Portugal, Spain. So it means that we still have the first and the most important provider of internet in the, in the, in the, to Africa. But also this is now changing because Africa is having more and more data centers and these data centers be, uh, of course, responsible to, to, to provide internet to Africa in a different way. So again, uh, Africa is taking uh, less dependence on if, of internet from the rest of the world. And with the increase of data centers, they will be more easy to access the internet, more easy to access the knowledge, and of course, more easy to access the, um, the, the development. So you see, Europe is a provider of internet. Um, Africa is it's 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 one of the, our best clients. Uh, but um, this is only to provide you a view that the relation to Africa still is north to south. Okay, is not is not yet a balance. Doesn't exist yet a balance between this. But we hope in the future this is going to be changed. Uh, also, because the number of global uh, sea cables, uh, they will increase. Um, if you see in the last 10 years, they almost double. So the number of sea cables that we have globally, it's huge. So uh, you see on 2023, we have 36 sea cables around the world that, start, that starts to operate. The majority of these cables, of course, they still connecting US, Europe, and Asia, but there are more and more sea cables that brings development communications to Africa, and this is of course very important. You see, Africa. Um, so uh, the, the 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 lines represents the, the sea cables, and the dots in green represents data centers. Data center is important because data center represents the connectivity and the access to the internet. And you see that now in 2023, the number of data centers in Africa, they are increasing. And of course, it will be interesting to see if these dots are the same points that Felix Ribeiro made on the map, because the number of persons they live in Nigeria, in Egypt and South Africa should be related with these data centers. But I'm, I'm, I'm just, just pointing that might be also to, 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 to the next step of the study to see how the number of persons in different cities in different countries are related with the access to the internet and to the data centers. So you see, Africa is growing, the northern part of Africa more than the south, of, co of course, the coastline is always much, much more important. But uh, my view is that this new paradigm, they will, of course, change completely the reality in Africa in the next couple of years. 
Uh, and if you see, uh, of course, that Africa is still behind the level of uh, development in the rest of the world, and you see the, the white, the, 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 the blue dots that represents big data centers that are going to be built in the next two, three years. And you see Europe, uh, Brazil, uh, but in Africa, not too much. But in, in, indeed, they will increase, but not at the same level of development as the rest of the world. But anyway, you, we, we see that is, of course, a, a changing. And then there is, of course, a difference and a development in this area. I, I would like to finish by saying that uh, this couple of slides, they show you some of examples what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, this is also some data about the sea cables that are now landing in these sub-regions, uh, which might be a good uh, opportunity to make the comparison between the sea cables and the connectivity and the access to information for the, the big cities and the number of habitants. And of course, Africa is gonna be, um, I would say, uh, the, 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 the land of the opportunities where the connectivity, the global connectivity will be a challenge for everybody, a challenge for the world, and of course, a challenge for the countries. Uh, in conclusion, uh, and to finish, I would like to underline two or three ideas. First is that, uh, as I point in the beginning, we are in a changing moment where we are facing a new paradigm uh, and when possibly the new access to knowledge can bring new access to development. Uh, the strategic location of these sea cables, of these data centers will make the difference. And the landing points, mm -hmm. it's only uh, 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 a point where we have to study and we have to connect with other uh, aspects of the study. Um, so we're going to see a different Africa uh, related to the economy, the, the, the challenge and the opportunities that might bring a big development and a big connection to the world. So. This is some uh, bibliography and some references that you can use. Uh, and thank you very much for, your, for the opportunity. And I will be more than happy to get your answers and your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Coronel Bernardino. So I'm going to make a proposal. So uh, I don't have any inscriptions yet, not even questions in the chat. So. I will propose to uh, Professor Karim Anayum uh, Ana, Ana, uh, to begin his presentation. If he is available and he is ready to go on. And in the end, we'll make the, the debate uh, on these uh, three presentations. We can also make questions for, uh, for the first speakers. So, uh, Professor Eli Anayum. Uyui, are you ready to to uh, to go on with your presentation? Yes, I am ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you to the uh, Institute of National Defense. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, let me be let me be brief and give you uh, uh, how we see uh, from here, uh, Morocco and uh, Africa, the New South. How we see. Uh, let's say the foreseeable future. Um, you asked me to uh, give you a, a couple of uh, thoughts about the, the 2030 horizon. Uh, let me first start that, of course, uh, there's the global environment, which we all face, uh, all countries, but uh, we face it in different ways. So uh, as we, <clears throat> we see a, a sort of uh, global recalibration of uh, geopolitical weights uh, around the world uh, with the winners and losers of a more open, uh, um, less rule-based order and a fragmented, uh, a fragmented uh, uh, trade system and economic system uh, 
which I think we're only seeing the uh, the start. Uh, so uh, that that Africa is not sort of not all countries in Africa, but Africa in general is not facing this as let's say Europe is facing it. And I think uh, the continent uh, could be one of the winners uh, of a more open, more fluid, more uh, you know less sort of. Uh, uh, this organized world with, with, with its dangers, of course, uh, and its challenges. But uh, if I take the middle income countries of Africa, such as Morocco, uh, those with have a strong internal front and a strong st political stability and national unity are about to gain from this more open world, uh, which I call the new south. Uh, you know, as to differentiate it from the global South that can be anti-ideological, that can be uh, uh, stra straightforwardly challenging uh, uh, the uh, the Western, the Occidental world, uh, which is uh, more uh, of uh, Russia, China, Iran, uh, North Korea, and a few others. So I think uh, there is a distinction to be made. And in Africa, in general, you don't find in a anti-ideological front against uh, the West. Uh, a couple of countries have still some uh, reminiscences of uh, uh, militant uh, origins uh, and uh, you know, post-revolutionary uh, uh, ways of looking at international relations. But in general, it's not, uh, it's not there that you find that confrontation. Um, so what it means is that uh, there's more optionality for partnerships. Uh, it means that uh, Africa is going to be courted uh, by uh, not necessarily the two large powers, uh, US and China, but by large emerging markets, uh, which have now the capacity to influence uh, you know, trade flows and, and uh, economic uh, outcomes. Uh, I can, can take the examples of countries in the Middle East that have recently set up large funds to invest in the green transition in Africa. The Emirates, for instance, has announced a fund along the, the last cup of uh, $60 billion. And there are a couple of other initiatives you can think of uh, large populous countries that were mentioned in the previous presentation, such as Indonesia, that will play an influential role, or Turkey is another one, uh, an influential role uh, in shaping uh, the, this rebalancing of, uh, of uh, you know, geopolitical relation. And I think Portugal and Europe uh, sits in a very special position, uh, given, uh, their, of course, the geography, uh, through the Atlantic with Portugal uh, and the west uh, western coast of uh, of, Europe, of of Africa, the Atlantic coast of Africa, but also the Mediterranean and Europe more generally. So uh, my first point is that uh, it is important that uh, Europe in general and European Union in specific uh, specifically rethink uh, its partnership with Africa in general. Uh, not because of uh, on moral grounds or uh, but just for the interest of European, just very, very sort of crude and clear and simple uh, interest. And uh, I'm sure you've uh, uh, you've uh, you saw uh, President Macron last the interview uh, yesterday saying that uh, Europe is itself caught between uh, China and US, not abiding to the rules and that we don't want to be, uh, you know, as you, we, meaning Europeans, being caught up uh, as being the only one respecting the rules, etc., and being in a way uh, the losers. So I think we are on the same boat on that front. So uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a very specific period. So that's the first mega trend that will shape the external relations and the place of Africa in the world. And of course, 
the reorganization, and that's my second point on the economics, the re reshuffling, reorganization, reinvention of global value chain through uh, a sort of rebirth of industrial policies around the world. So in the US, this Inflation Reduction Act, this is also uh, in Europe with the with uh, the global gateway and all the countries getting into uh, uh, heavy state interventions in 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 uh, in the economy through in the uh, industrial policy uh, and here uh, i think uh, in terms of uh, being attractive as a as a connector between markets given the demographics that were explained given the not the domestic consumption, uh, as we can see, driven again by demographics, uh, there is a lot to do. Uh, I think Africa has a has a has, a, uh, has a, an immense opportunity of uh, of being uh, a key player, a key connector, a trusted, uh, predictable partner uh, for uh, Europe and the US uh, in that uh, in that front, and more generally. Uh, Within the Atlantic, which is something at the policy center we've been working on for 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 a long time, an extended view of the Atlantic, a wider Atlantic, which includes, uh, of course, Latin America and uh, South America and uh, uh, and Africa. So there, it is already happening uh, because of the free trade agreement that a couple of countries have uh, have uh, with Europe. But particularly for Morocco, as one of the few, I think the only country, I stand to be corrected, that has both a free trade agreement of a free trade zone with the, the US and Europe at the same time. Uh, we are already seeing lots of interest from companies uh, trying to, uh, to reorganize the, the, the division of, of their production processes around the world and using Morocco uh, as, a, as a basis. It has happened in the automobile sector. Tudo Morocco, for instance, exports close to 600,000 cars a year. It's happening in the aeronautic industry where we have the big players here, Boeing and, and Airbus, and uh, 200 companies around them here producing uh, a, a, a airplane parts here, here in Morocco. And I, I think that, uh, you know, the order, that will also grow in Africa as connectivity improves, infrastructure improves, uh, the pressure of the US-China rivalry and what it means for Europe. I think this is also one of the, the second uh, mega trends and uh, reshuffling and reorganization of economic flows. This is happening, of course, uh, in a context of fragmented economy, world economy with the rising protectionism against uh, the two large blocks. Uh, but here, Africa and Europe, I think we are on the same sort of uh, we're we're on the same uh, on the same side of things being challenged by this uh, increased increased protectionism, uh, this uh, sort of uh, less rule based uh, order. Uh, of, to benefit from this, for you know, all fifty four countries of Africa won't benefit equally. Are not well prepared. Uh, all of them. There are still many conflicts, as you've been following, particularly in the Sahel. But those countries that are organized, that have a minimum political stability, that are sort of a clear economic strategy, and we can quote five, ten of them, uh, could could in fact benefit from the two soft uh, dynamics I have been trying to uh, to describe uh, to you. Uh, and the third one is, of course, climate, and which is not uh, specific to Africa, uh, but climate is, uh, is uh, of course, putting pressure on, uh, on, on countries, on risk management, but particularly on agriculture. Uh, it needs funding. Uh, don't forget, most of African countries are middle-income and low-income countries, so financing the, the, the development, the is a, is a fundamental uh, challenge. So simply financing infrastructure, education systems, health systems, et cetera. Uh, and this requires uh, funding as well as the transition, uh, you know, the climate uh, transition and particularly uh, energy, uh, energy, but as well as uh, uh, you know, the technology that goes with it. Uh, as of today, we don't have 
the institutions to do that. There are uh, ongoing discussion on the reform on the international financial architecture, and particularly the, the, the institutions such as the World Bank and on the continent, the African Development Bank, and uh, how can we sort of balance uh, smartly uh, the challenges of financing development and financing the climate transition. Uh, the Policy Center for the New Side, we are very active on this topic because we think uh, that uh, uh, we need a, lar a larger World Bank, a ba World Bank at scales with the, 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 the challenges of financing this double transition, development and climate, uh, and that uh, the capital of this institution has to be uh, increased significantly. Um, it's not happening for political reasons. Again, uh, competition of large powers at the at the board of these, those institutions. But the risk is that uh, uh, alternative solution will be uh, will be uh, will come up, uh, and particularly. If uh, from those large emerging markets I mentioned earlier on, creating alternatives to the World Bank. Uh, it means that for advanced economies, a less, less influential role, uh, in a way, uh, uh, a, a strong political... Uh, political how, how would I say that? Uh, that the... Africans, you know, have uh, are very keen on having a larger World Bank, a larger financial, you know, developmental flows, and uh, I think uh, taking this institution uh, in a way uh, and as a hostage of those comp as those these rivalries is not is not a smart uh, a smart move for the future. That's uh, what I think, uh, and uh, the alternative will come up. Uh, China has come came up with one, the Belt and Road Initiative. In a way, this is exactly that. Uh, there's 20 years now for experience of with China financing development in Africa. There are good experience, less less good experiences. Uh, countries have now drawn the lessons uh, of, uh, of of this partnership with China. Uh, so uh, this will remain a, a fundamental. Uh, a question is financing the development of Africa and the greening of its economy. The fifth one is a more difficult, and if we're looking now in you know, six to five years, 2030, which the horizon you suggested we, we, we think of, uh, uh, macroeconomic policies will remain under pressure. Uh, as you know, debt has increased. Uh, uh, that has increased quite a lot since COVID and multiple shocks over the years. So fiscal space is tiny in many countries. Interest rates are going down recently, and the Fed has reduced its interest rates. But still, uh, there's pressure to balance uh, the needs, the, the, the pressures on the, on the budget, but and maintain prudent and sustainable macroeconomic policies will remain the difficult balancing act for many countries. As you know, a couple of them are already uh, under uh, programs with the IMF, uh, and more could come. And there's the issue of debt restructuring. There are ongoing discussion, particularly with China. But here again, if the politics is making it difficult uh, to happen. And so many countries will need to uh, to 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 walk a tiny line uh, between those uh, those uh, this, <clears throat> those policies, so uh, including exchange rate pressure uh, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, fiscal uh, fiscal uh, fiscal policies. So let me stop here. Of course, there's the there are demands from the populations uh, following uh, COVID. There are. Uh, the state is back everywhere. Uh, I mentioned industrial policy, but it's back everywhere. Uh, it's it, it's not back because uh, he wanted to be back. It's also back because uh, it's a demand from population of more protections uh, all around the world uh, for more social safety nets, for a state that can intervene in a more risky environment, uh, 
Uh, and uh, this uh, trend is shared. It is. It exists in Africa, of course, and it is also at at uh, you know within Europe at least. And, uh, and that that means that we an efficient state that is functional, that is capable of providing social safety net, health, education efficiently at reasonable costs to their population. African countries are under the same pressure as you are in Europe to deliver that. So in a nutshell, very quickly, it's really sketchy, but what I see is a, is a tough, difficult uh, environment which will require complex policies with the very fine equilibria, uh, but for those countries that are able to walk this very complex uh, uh, policy environment, uh, important outcomes and a, a sort of uh, a higher value of their geopolitical stance in the world, more interest from their partner, more interest for for cooperation, for uh, partnership and for uh, uh, economic uh, economic relations. So it is a time for many of us to re review our partnerships, to re review uh, how we look at the world, to recalibrate, rethink, uh, get rid of our preconceptions uh, uh, in this in this environment. So and then I can only uh, salute this initiative where policymakers and thinkers and academic uh, need to work together uh, to, to, uh, to, to try. And this has to be done within every country, but this has to be done at you know, cross-national cross uh, level when they are available. And I think uh, you know, between Africa and Europe, we don't lack uh, those forums uh, where we can uh, discuss uh, uh, these uh, shared uh, challenges. Um, which uh, calls for shared uh, responses. Thank you very much again for having me with you today. Thank you, Professor. So I didn't have the opportunity to, because you began your presentation right away, to, to tell you how, how happy you are, we are to count on you as our guest speaker. It's an honor for, uh, for us. Thank you very much. So uh, I hope on the floor, I think you can make questions uh, to all the, our guest speakers on all the subjects. I have it already here, the questions on the chat. The first one, uh, with the ongoing energy transition and the increased decentralization of energy sources, sun, wind, etc., to what extent will the countries that currently hold fossil fuel sources lose power and consequently the attention they currently receive so uh i don't know who wants to to handle this question uh yeah. well uh, bernardo uh, first oh, to uh, i'm going to give the floor to professor Felix Rigoit. And then I pass to you, okay? Uh, I think the problem of uh, energy transition, I think the country that is done perhaps the most interesting approach is Japan. Because Japan has decided to uh, recalibrate all of its energy centered now in hydrogen and resolving the problem of how to obtain hydrogen. And Japan has done a very big uh, uh, technology investment in trying to obtain hydrogen from, from uh, coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, and it, uh, Japan has made a partnership with Australia to transform its coal in hydrogen that nowadays Australia exports to Japan. Japan has made a partnership with Saudi Arabia, Arabia to obtain from oil, hydrogen, and also ammonia 
and nowadays Saudi Arabia exports ammonia without emissions from Saudi oil to Japan. I think Japan is the most, how to say it, um, intelligent country in what regards um, the in energy transition. United States is also very interesting, not with hydrogen, not with uh, renewable energies, because every country will obtain and use energy, uh, 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 renewable energy, but with the, the research on nuclear fusion. Uh, the United States uh, has uh, helped create an association of enterprises or, or industrial enterprises that work in nuclear fusion. Uh, in uh, 16, um, 16 um, areas of technology investment or, or, or development to obtain uh, uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, I, I think Europe has made a, a, a very sad uh, option, which is concentrate everything in renewable energies, in uh, green uh, hydrogen, and in uh, uh, electric cars, uh, working with um, um, the classic uh, batteries, the classic batteries in the sense of those batteries that we have inherited from information technologies. I think it is important for Africa to work not against oil and natural gas, but to try to have partnerships with enterprises and countries that are trying to use oil and gas without burning them. Because the problem of uh, the energy transition is uh, is fire. The discover of fire from humanity uh, is the problem, the central problem we have to uh, resolve because we can use oil and gas without burning them. This is a, a, a very simple thing. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the Arab Emirates, Emirates are all, 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 both of them, working with Japan in this. This is my opinion. Thank you, Professor. So I think, uh, Bernardino, you wanted to comment also on this question. Please go on. Um, it, thank you, Coral. It's a very short comment. Uh, well, my point is about communication, connectivity, and one of these uh, connectivity is the data centers and the data centers to work in its energy. But it's not the energy that provides from the oil or from the, no, no, we are talking about green energy. So Africa also needs to change the paradigm and they need to, needs to build more uh, access to the, uh, what we call green energy, hydrogen. And this is gonna be useful because this is gonna be, of course, side by side with the other kind of development. And a good example that I give, of course, is about Morocco, because Morocco is one of the best mm. uh, producer of green energy in Africa and in the world. And of course, this is the solution, not only in, in Morocco, but taking this solution for all the continent. Also, the access to energy needs, needs to change. And I believe also that we are in a new phase, in a new paradigm, where different countries can face different problems, but 
in the future. Uh, and I think uh, Professor uh, Karim can elaborate a little bit more, but the example of Morocco, it's a good example in Africa. Thank you very much. I think there's a question uh, in the chat that was addressed uh, to me, uh, which is quite interesting. It's about migration and uh, 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 what it, uh, the ongoing, uh, very difficult uh, discussions uh, that uh, uh, are happening in Europe. Uh, uh, this is, of course, a tough topic, and this has very important consequences on many uh, political, internal political dynamics in several countries and results outcomes of elections. Uh, this is a topic where we need to be uh, reasonable and then where we need to uh, to work to get together. Uh, myself, I've written a paper with one of my co-authors about the seasonal program that Morocco has with Spain for many years. You can find it on our website. There are interesting lessons. Uh, it's been, uh, and there are. So what I think is uh, the solution beyond you know, political exploitation of this difficult and uh, radioactive topic, uh, divisive, and it is also used by uh, some of uh, the countries that want to divide Europe as well as a, as a tool of uh, destabilization. I think we need to uh, have more uh, dialogue among ourselves. Uh, as you know, more, most of the migrations happen in Africa. 90% of the migrants move within countries and 10 with externally, but the images are, are, are difficult. And I think they have to do also with the changing demographics in Europe as well, where population the population is aging uh, with the, uh, the tensions between pensioners and younger uh, younger members of the population that have not the same uh, view of what public expenditure should be. So this is a topic we take very seriously at the Policy Center. We, have, we are launching uh, projects uh, where you will see a, a, the special, a special dossier in the coming weeks uh, that will be of interest. And we are not only writing us as Moroccans, but I have uh, several Europeans and other Africans writing on that. So if there's interest on your side, we'll be very happy to cooperate and to come up also with the concrete ideas uh, because the trends are here. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, hosted, uh, I hosted an Italian uh, businessman at the head of a chamber of commerce representing uh, thousands and thousands of medium and small size enterprise. And he told me that they have 800,000 unfilled positions of technicians and all sorts of technical uh, needs for their workforce, 800,000. So on one side, you have the politics of it. And on the other side, you have the economics of it. And today it is not reconciling. Uh, and if you need to grow and to innovate more, look at the report, the Mario Draghi report. Uh, it has to do with human capital, innovation, dynamism, etc. So uh, this is not going to be solved in the short term, but you have partners to discuss with. You have several countries here on the continent which you can have uh, discussions and come up with, uh, with solutions. But I think... Uh, uh, and this is this is a this is a tough a tough topic. This is uh, uh, because it has you know, reminiscences and it can be also very ugly in a way. So let us just take this very 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 seriously and let us you know contribute as we can as academics, think tankers on this topic. Thank you, Professor. Uh, since this is a subject uh, that normally is in the field of research, uh, that uh, Teresa Rodriguez, I don't know if she wants to comment on this question uh, before passing to another question we have on the chat. Professor Teresa Rodriguez, do you, do you want to make any comment? Please open your mic. Uh, well, 
I think uh, we have a small problem with uh, the connection. So I'll go on with uh, the question we have in the in the chat. In the, later, if uh, Professor Trilogy wants to comment, I will give her the floor. So this is also addressed to Professor Karim. Uh, uh, Professor Karim delivered a very insightful talk, bearing in mind the short timeline of six years up to 2030, and briefly touched upon China's interaction with Africa. How do we go from an African perspective, China experiments on the past 20 years, mainly financing mega projects to attain own strategic goals going forward? Professor Karim? I think uh, some countries are already, uh, you know, like Zambia and a few others are already, uh, they got, uh, you know, the debt stress and they had to negotiate. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, common framework that is set between the Paris Club and the IMF and now China that is being an important creditor. It's a bit of a technical discussion, but the main message is that this 20-year experience, uh, some countries have ended up in, in debtness. So, so there's, a, there's an issue. From an African country perspective, I think countries want to have optionality, alternative, you know, multiple source of funding. They don't want to be only uh, sort of uh, with China on financing, you know, some of their infrastructure, etc. There was also... Uh, there were also cases where the governance of the projects and the natures of the contract, which were sort of uh, lack transparencies uh, that have uh, produces uh, uh, poor results. So there's a wealth of experience. And I think the solution is really what I said before. Let us have a stronger World Bank. Let us have a strong European Investment Bank and European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, play a, a, a stronger role with the, the, the you know, the, the, the high standard of transparency and governance that they have, but they need to be at scale and they could play a role. China is changing itself as well. You know, they created the new development bank, the Asia and Investment Infrastructure Bank. So they're trying to, to change the way they do, uh, they, they, they do funding for those uh, for those countries. There will be competition about natural resources, of course, and we need to have alternatives. So, in absence of 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 uh, you know a reform of these international financial institutions, then alternatives will have the place to you know uh, to uh, to be uh, to be uh, demanded here on the continent. So, I mentioned these funds coming from the Gulf, but they are. You know, a couple of other initiatives, they can end up as being uh, important institution lending to Africa. So there again, I think Europe with the US have an important role uh, to play as the initiator of the Bretton Woods uh, system. So we need a new Bretton Woods system that is, you know, at scale and also uh, efficient, consistent with today's challenge, which is climate and financing the the, the development uh, of Africa. It's not enough just to say China is not financing with the, you know, the governance, etc. It, it, we need to propose an alternative. Uh, uh, but again, there's 20 years of experience, as I said, with, uh, with uh, you know, situa difficult situation with some assets that were also, uh, uh, you know, taken as part of uh, compensation of the debt, which has made some countries uh, not very comfortable, and others are looking at that. So you know, this this it's not that clear today. So, and uh, as well, uh, look at the outcomes of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there are successes beyond the announcements, but they are also uh, you know being quite slow in many in many countries as well. So countries have been also cautious uh, in taking up uh, in taking up the, this the, the you know debt from from China as well. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I just have here one uh, in the chat uh, some, uh, from a preposition from a previous question 
connected with uh, fossil uh, uh, fuel. Now it's addressed to Professor Teresa Luis and to Professor Karim to make, uh, I don't know if you want to, to make some pinpoint in this question concerning the use of power and prominence uh, by the countries which have the pollution of uh, fossil fuel, fuel sources. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Karim, I don't know if you want to uh, elaborate on this. Since I don't have Professor Teresa Rodriguez, I believe. I'm not a specialist of oil and gas. Uh, what I can see is that uh, uh, gas continues to be uh, uh, to be uh, sought after. That investments are are, are still ongoing, uh, and that the transition will take time. Uh, but at the same time, major companies are also hedging their bets and trying to diversify their portfolio and invest heavily in uh, in renewable energy. As you know, uh, the continent, particularly uh, Morocco, has you know such a high intensity in 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 in, uh, in sun and as well very cheap the cheapest cost actually in the world for uh, wind energy. Uh, there's huge potential again here for cooperation, for interlinking our energy uh, network. There's also hydrogen that is uh, uh, seeing as a as an interesting source of energy, but also uh, electricity production that could be produced uh, here and uh, sent across uh, cables. And technology here plays an important role. So the technology is changing every day. Uh, it makes it difficult to invest, but it is also something we could organize among ourselves. So how we have this technology, uh, can it uh, can it flow? So I think that's uh, uh, for certain countries, of course, that are heavily relying on oil, particularly oil, uh, less so gas maybe, uh, these are, will create immense challenge of uh, reconverting their economies um, uh, uh, for that, about the question of decentralization, uh, of course, it makes it uh, easier to have a decentralized grid. It's particularly important for countries that are not well equipped today. If you take Morocco again, we are close to you are hundred percent access to energy and water in the country, but for most countries where there's very little access and sparsely populated uh, areas, uh, this possibility to decentralize. Uh, the energy production is uh, is quite interesting. There is also the combination with the very uh, pressure on water that we have uh, of desalinated water using uh, green energy, which is also uh, uh, something very promising where they have already interest investment happening. So I would say this is an, a sector that is needs technology, financing, uh, you know, markets, uh, cooperation, uh, and that uh, I would put it under the umbrella of industrial policies that I mentioned earlier on, where there is also a whole chain of product producers uh, and uh, that needs to be, uh, uh, to be organized. And another, uh, you know, another area where I think uh, cooperation is, uh, is essential. Thank you very much. I don't see uh, further questions. Nobody raised hands. So uh, uh, before thanking uh, our uh, speakers and our auditors, uh, I'll give the floor to our director, Professor Isabel Kulenich, for some final remarks, please. Thank you, Colonel Beringer. Just a final note. Uh, to uh, e express uh, our thanks to all our speakers uh, for your contribution to this webinar, to Professor Teresa Rodrigues and Professor uh, Felix Rivail for your excellent presentation of the findings of the article, which we will publish in the journal of the Institute Nação e Defesa. It will be published on the issue uh, next December. Uh, if some some of the participants are asking for the PowerPoints, and of course, if uh, with the exception of uh, the first presentation, because it will be published in our journal, if our speakers will allow us, we will provide uh, the participants with the PowerPoint presentations. Also, a word of thanks to Professor Luis Bernardino 
to whom Africa is, is a research topic of excellence, but also, um, let's say, a practical stage of work for him that he knows extremely well. And to Professor El um, Ainauni, uh, I would ask, I would um, express our appreciation as well for the excellent presentation you have offered us. And allow me to congratulate you uh, for the excellent work that the Policy Center for the New South has been developing. Um, I, I've just read your last report, 2023, very, very interesting work. And I would vividly recommend all our participants to navigate on their website and explore what they have to offer. Thank you very much to all of you. And because we don't want to uh, let Africa forgotten, of course, and we do want to keep it in our research agenda and also in the activities of public awareness the Institute organizes, uh, on the 3rd of December, we will have a conference here at the National Defense Institute, also on Africa and the challenges in the international system. And we will address different topics from those who, which have been presented today, from the security and defense architecture in African countries, to um, fundamentalism and terrorism, to a closer look into the Gulf of Guinea and the challenges that arise from there, also to climate change, to energy transition, to digital transition, uh, and many other topics. So you, you are most welcome to be with us on that day, 3rd of December, during the afternoon. Um, it was a pleasure to have you all, um, and thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.